Hello, and welcome to what is going to be a first of thing I've ever done it, be, uh, done it this way. I don't think I've ever done a video this way. So let me explain what is going to happen. Because it's going to even interest me. So, someone joined a live, put forward an idea. They said, ah. You're sort of treating this like the end of year course. Will you add in the end of year questions like you would if you were doing a university course? And I thought, hmm, I can make a slide at the end like that. And then I thought, I can make this a lot more fun. I can make this a lot more fun. So I'm going to give you a heads up now. If you feel like taking this as an exam, I'm actually doing the exam. I will set up a channel on Discord. And it'll be for you to submit PDF form essays. Okay? That's what I'll set it up on. And if you want to take the exam, you're more than welcome to. Stick, please stick to the rules. Um, I put in what provisions that you normally do. Honestly, I've copied out my joke exemplar. Um, rules for an exam. So, I I basically have gone for them. So, please note, they aren't how I put them. I make them far more professional and proper when I'm doing an exam at university. But, well, you know, I thought I might as well. I thought it might be a good thing to do. And certainly fun. To make him a little bit more fun than I normally would. So, shameless plug for the channel, Tribals, Battles and Darings. Please note, every time I read it, I do, I, I, I will have to sort of, I, I do notice little things in there which I go, oh, e and honestly, it's going to sound strange. It's, it's one of the things doing a book has completely changed in me is my approach to those things, because I know how many people read it, I know how many times I went through it, how many times other people went through it, how many different people went through it. And then you look at it and go, oh, frigate. That typo made it the whole way through. And how did no one notice it? And you honestly don't know. You don't know. Microsoft Word, no computer system ever noticed it. It's mine. But it's still good. It's still good. Oh, botheration, our frigates have become our battleships. Whatever we go a-cruising in now. That's basically the point at which we start talking about gun and cruisers. That's not the point we start talking about cruising. And that's sort of a subtext of this course, the whole way through, of this course, sorry. The, of the subject, uh, so now I've started to think of it like a course. I'm not, uh, my brain's not going to stop thinking about it as a course. It's one of those things. Once you start thinking it through and thinking, oh, what's this? What's that? What can I do? What have I done? It becomes very different. You know, I have on my screen rotating in front of me on this screen are all sorts of pictures of cruisers at the moment. And, yeah. Looking at cruisers, looking at the hundred years of gun cruisers as a way of holding the whole year together has been interesting. I know I haven't covered everything. I haven't covered every type of cruiser. No, I haven't. It has not been exhaustive. But there again, no university lecture group is ever exhaustive. It's always supposedly based partially on doing your own reading. And for that reason, we have things structured as possible, as, as they are. There'll be 12 questions. Exam rules are the follows. Five books are out to be brought into the exam. Now, I always limit to five. It is an open book exam. There are some who limit it to one. I usually limit to five. The reason I say five is if you allow you bring people to bring any more than that, they can't put them on their desk and not have space for everything. And they have, they can't be stored in their bag. They can't keep going down into their bag and coming out, going down the bag. It just is, it breeds problems. And it breeds pieces of paper going all the place. Those books will be have to flick through, show there's no piece of paper stuck in them. 
that's it. But there again, honestly, there's not really the kind of scenario where you can bring pieces of paper into the exam. Anything else? Academic writing is required. No use of the first person. I know this sounds strange, but I, me, my, or all those things. It's one of the first rules of academic writing that you don't use them. And after a while you get so used to do writing that way, you actually are terrible at writing any other way. And you can sound impersonal the whole time. But there is a reason for it. It's a trick, actually, because it's supposed to help you take yourself out of the situation to an extent and try and not position yourself above it, but position yourself as someone who's watching it, taking a step back rather than being involved in it. <laughs> referencing where possible is encouraged, but not a criteria. After all, you do have the books with you. So if you're going to be referencing something, I would presume you're referencing the five books you have with you. In which case, you should use them. You're not allowed to use the internet. You're not allowed to use your phone. Phones off, left at the front door is the usual rule. You have your computer, that will be a box computer, won't have access to the internet. Yeah, we're quite cruel sometimes. You're not looking it, it, it even has solitaire turned off. It's just it's just being cruel and usual punishment. Um answer any two questions of your choice in the time allowed. Four hours, extra time allocations are twenty five percent and fifty percent depending upon your assessed need. So if you're moderately dyslexic, you might get 25%. If you're badly dyslexic, you'll get 50%. If you have to have a scribe, which is someone to write your or write or type for you because for some reason you can't do it or anything like that, um, you usually have 50% because often that's a scenario where you're going to have to communicate with someone else. I, I've had students who've managed to break both their hands. Skiing before an exam. Um, <coughs> a few weeks before an exam, when it's a case of... Okay, so you're not going to be able to type your exam, are you? Nope. Right then. So there's a PhD student who's going to earn some money. They all, they all look very, very happy in thinking they're going to get a PhD student from the War Studies Department or History Department, whichever you're teaching in. And no, you send in a PhD student from the English Department who knows absolutely nothing about history, but is very good at typing and very friendly and very kind. And it's a case of, yeah, you really thought we were going to give you someone who might actually give you a, he'll be able to help you with your answers. <laughs> no, we'll give you someone who can do uh, who can do the typing incredibly well, and we'll make sure we'll probably help you with the structure and the styling, but can't help you with the content at all. And well, yes, then there's my other joke. Usually, this is example is always know where to lose are, but um. Nearest lose are, f are three levels below ground level. Don't expect phone signal. If you can manage to somehow cheat by borrowing to mo uh, by borrowing mole, you will earn extra credit for ingenuity upon full and proper explanation of how you did it. As well, of course, of earning the opportunity to do a retake aboard HMS Oberon in Chatham Dockyard when either moles nor dof dolphins will be able to reach you. Yeah. Never, of course, use that with students. But I have it in there because I always talk to other, usually, PhD students when they're starting to learn how to set up examining techniques. Put some jokes in there when you're explaining it to students, make it a bit more fun. And there was a place where it changed very... It was first year I was teaching there, it changed afterwards, where literally the only lose for the examination hall were three levels down. And so I came up with this joke, which I then told them, and said, yeah, so you can make jokes about that. But there was also a head of the department sitting next to me going, we do not like to make these jokes because that might encourage the students to do it. I was going, there are really students going to go out there and train burrowing moles? Really? It's always the first line. Anyway, uh, the armoured corvette. The thing that turns up before the cruiser, as the transition to the cruiser, and then become either third or second class cruisers, depending on who's making the decision and what uh, which navy they belong to. But the French ones are good. The French ones are very good. 
And apologies if I'm burping at all or etc. I'm still... I was ill today. Okay. I apologize. So, question one. Define and extrapolate upon the development of the cruising role. With reference to relevant historical examples, what does it do and what value? Let me just check. I love Microsoft Word. I love it, I really do. Copy and paste from Word into PowerPoint. <laughs> this is why I shouldn't do I shouldn't do things quickly. what does it what value does it provide a nation? That's an interesting question. And that's just question one of 12. So, the Juno Cole. You also have to remember that, because that is part of the development of cruisers. The Juno Cole is as much about cruisers as it is about torpedoes. The fact that that cruising is the traditional guerre de course, pretty much. The traditional operations of the second power against the major naval power. Neither here nor there. The idea was that the major naval power's fleet would be swept from the sea by torpedo boats, and then the cruisers of the of the NATO would go out and sweep the enemy's trade from the seas. There's always a chance it works. It's an offset strategy. It means you don't have to invest in the major weapons which are used to fight them. Question two. In the early days of the transition, to what extent were sales critical to the fulfillment of the cruiser role? Answer using relevant examples. It's an interesting question. Now remember, it's any two questions. I'd hear them all out before you make your choice. And also, I'd be careful which five books you pick. General Admiral, the first armoured cruiser. It's always interesting the Russians really get there first, but there again, it's not surprising. The Russians are always this power trying to assert themselves. There's a great argument about them being a land power, so why do they bother with naval power? Well, they are such a massive land power, they have to worry about naval power. If you think about that, a great deal of their internal logistics are sea logistics, by virtue of the reality of their geostrategic position and their geographic position. Because, yeah, they have a railway running down the centre of them now. But that railway is a single track for most of the route. It's not really that useful for moving large volume logistics. And not for trading externally, which you need to do in order to grow your economy and get goods and things in from outside that you don't produce. And if you're a country which has the food storage ability of a gnat, which Russia often seems to do, in fact, that's an insult to gnats, um, then you really need your global trade to be working out. And an armoured cruiser, sensible? Question three, make the case for which vessel, in your opinion, represents the true first steam cruiser? Mm-hmm. Which is the true ship, which is the true first steam cruiser? I'll look forward to seeing which ships are picked and who pick what ships you pick if you do it this one. I have no idea which questions will be popular. That's one of the things the advantage is when you're writing an exam paper and you're putting together for students you have spent the last year mm, talking to for at least a couple of hours a week, you sort of have an idea of what well talking at for a couple of hours and talking with for a couple of hours a week, probably. Lecture and seminar time combined. You sort of have an idea of what you think they're going to go for in terms of the questions. Sometimes you're wrong, but rarely. Mm. 
I have no idea. I have no idea if anyone will actually do any of them. Hmm. Esmeralda, the first Ellswick protected cruiser. Oof. A good ship. A really good ship. Question four. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines a cruiser as a large, fast, moderately armed and gunned warship. To what extent do you agree with this statement? And with critical discussion of relevant examples, make your case. Ouch. No, that is actually a good question. I have to admit, I often do pick the Merriam-Webster Dictionary because, in my experience, other dictionaries tend to provide a far more defined and um, expansive answer and criteria. Whereas, on certain things, like military aspects, the Merriam-Webster seems to be brilliantly simple with out much nuance, context, or other things. So you can do something like this and give people a lot of license to go and answer questions and go and investigate more and think more. That's the important thing. Ah, the USS Atlanta. The first American cruiser. And a really cool vessel. One of the first four steel ships of the US Navy. And I would argue one of the most important ships of the US Navy because... I would argue the success of Atlanta is what leads them to being having quite so many cable cruisers as they do have during the Spanish-American War, without which they would not have won. It's their cruiser force which wins that war for them, not their battleship force. If you think about the Philippines and all the other distant actions that take place, it's their cruiser force. All the actions which take place in the Caribbean, their cruiser force are what managed to get them the kills and get them the wins. It would have been a blockade with the battleship force. And they probably would have won, but it would have been a longer, far more drawn-out affair. And who knows, the Spanish might have rallied. There's a chance. There's a chance. Don't be cruel now. There's a chance. Which might. It has been said that for the last two decades of the 19th century, cruisers were little more than second-rate and second-class battleships. I'm not going to reveal which officer said this, but no, they're not part of... It's A, it's a translation from a foreign language to English. And uh, B, to be fair, their later actions disproved this view, so I'm not getting into it. To what extent do you agree with the statement and with critical discussion of relevant examples, make your case? Mm -hmm. And if you do manage to track down who made that, uh, made that quote, I'll be really interested. Again, I have been known to ask this sort of question in exams before. Basically, put in a quote, not put in on the name of it, and go, if you know who did it, that would be make me really interested. Because it mean you've done the reading around the quote, a reading around the subject. And that's another reason why you're not allowed to use the internet exams. In the exams, you're allowed to use books only. Mm -hmm. HMS Warrior. Honestly, the fact that she was a frigate meant she was always destined for the cruising role in my mind. But she was a battleship. She was a battleship. She's built, she becomes a battleship. There are ships of the line which do... most. In fact, there's no, not a single ship of the line in the world at the time which would really like to take on Warrior. They'd all prefer to volunteer their sisters to take on Warrior. They didn't want to do it. And yet she's a frigate. She's a cruiser. Or what, well, for the cruising role. Not a cruiser, because cruisers have what come about because frigates are no longer cruisers. A frigate. Able to do a cruising role, because they are now your battleships. A.K.A. capital ships. A commonly argued view after the 1920s, and please note I did say 1920s, not after Jutland, because it's Later on, this view gets to start taking, uh, taking root, not after Jutland. Can be summed up as battle cruisers were never cruisers, always second rate battleships. To what extent do you agree with this statement and, with critical discussion of relevant examples, make your case? Mm hmm. Enjoy. Ah, Blucher. Now, Blucher is an exa excellent example of what armored cruisers could have become 
whilst at the same time being a terrible example of jumping on your bare minimum intelligence to try and get ahead of your opponent and finding out that they're actually building something completely different. You think a Dreadnought Armoured Cruiser is an Armoured Cruiser built to Dreadnought lines and Dreadnought form. If you looked at the previous Armoured Cruisers the British have built, they were already Dreadnought form and shape, so maybe you're considering a continuation of those. But they hadn't been called Dreadnought Armoured Cruisers, at which point you really should have started thinking, well, maybe there's something different going on here. And of course there was. It was the fact that it was basically Dreadnought guns level armoured cruiser. Question seven. Probably, and I would admit, the most tough and complicated question to actually answer. It's kind of a... Not a trick question, but it's definitely a challenging question. Examining the differing views of Cable, Corbett, Gorshkov, and Mahan as to the relevance of cruisers to naval warfare and using them as a prism, evaluate one major and one minor nation's construction program. Please note. I didn't define which war or when it was leading up to. That's the evil part. You have to put them in... To properly examine them, you have to pick a sensible war. And you have to pick one, a sensible war, they're both fighting at the same time. Otherwise, it's not a balanced evaluation. So that's a test of you. That's a test of the student in regards. It's a test of them to go, can they critically think, examine the question and work out what they need to do. But I'm not sure whether I get that question past a review board. I might do, depending how much iron brew I can give them, but um, most boards aren't, don't tend to be swayed by iron brew that much. Ah, town class cruisers. 1910. Oh, they're beautiful. The Royal Navy needed something to provide numbers. It's this kind of thing. They get, they get five years into the Dreadnought project. They've been cutting ships left, right, and center, and suddenly they're going, Sugar! We need numbers! Crack them out. And they open the taps and out come the town class hordes. And it's just what they need. And they just build them so fast. An often quoted maxim is that naval strategy is a procurement strategy. Using this as a guide, evaluate the Japanese and Italian procurement plans of the 1920s and 1930s to look for similarities and differences of proposed operational doctrine. Now, whereas the previous question is sort of the free thinking, make of it what you will, challenge yourself if you wish question, this is the defined one, and it's still difficult because it's picked Japanese and Italian rather than British and American, or Italian and French, or German and French, or any of the options that you can have gone with which would be far more closely to climb together and far easier to put this also together, so it's still complicated, but it's defined out. So for, you put the, you make these sort of questions, you, you put in a balance of questions, you've got the question which would suit the person who wants to try and go their own way. For example, I would have probably gone for the previous question. Why? Because I was the kind of, I am the kind of geek who volunteered to do two dissertations during my bachelor's because I like to do my own work. I like to go my own, I like to do sort of stuff which is structured entirely myself. And I can adapt it and do it, make of it what I will. I can then completely go off topic and possibly and still fall and fall on my own sword. That's quite possible, but it's still good. it's still fun to do. But not everyone is like that. Not everyone has that desire to do that or has the confidence to do that. So you have to have questions which have, will bring out their similar levels of skill and ability and sort of an act as actually confidence builders because if you can answer this question it's quite a tough one you're good but are defined enough that they don't immediately run or they don't see the question and see it as immediately as the previous version i'm not necessarily the best at exam at exam writing i really am not um there are people who are better than me who i am learning still learning from and still constantly trying to get myself, make myself better. But 
Yeah. Plus, I have sort of played with the questions a bit because of the uh, because this is for YouTube, and I thought you'd enjoy slightly harder questions than easier ones. The Condottori. They were a fun series to do. They really were. And they're good ships. But they're also terrible ships. <laughs> because they're just so lightly armoured. If you're going to cheat, cheat properly. Please, if you're going to cheat, cheat properly. That's all I ever ask. 70 crew cruisers was the requirement that the Royal Navy sought to prepare itself for World War II. In order to achieve the same without being forced to break treaties, they accepted a small allocation of 8-inch arm vessels in place of, in the place of 6-inch arm vessels. Sorry. Sending cruisers was a requirement of the Royal Navy sort of the Royal Navy sought to prepare itself for World War II. In order to achieve the same without being forced to break treaties, they accept a small allocation of 8-inch arm vessels, and in their place a larger allocation of 6-inch arm vessels. Making reference to relevant examples, to what extent do you agree with their decision to do so and how they went about it? Sorry, I noticed that there was some ambiguity in the question. And like with any contract, ambiguity always benefits the person who is not writing the contract. So we're going to judge their benefit. So I changed it. This is again process of my question to go through a review process and aren't written in about 20 minutes. <sighs> By one person. Quickly. <laughs> it's a good question though. It's... It's a it's a question which will make you uh, which can sound easy but is going to challenge you to go further especially when you start to think of relevant examples making reference to relevant examples you have to go outside the Royal Navy but you also have to include the Royal Navy's examples and you have to match up those things it's fun Algerie 1932 oh, she's a good looking ship isn't she she is Ah, it's such a shame she didn't get to do anything in World War II. It, it would have been such a vindication of French naval efforts and French maritime industrial construction. Terrible for the actual fighting and the people on the receiving end and all sort of the things that go on. And let's be honest, as Wellington put it, there, the only thing worse than a battle won is a battle lost. And the damage it does to people on so many different levels, yeah. But there again, the part of me that's the historian and loves the engineering and looks at all those things sits there and goes, that such a ship had such an end when it was the product of so much work and so many generations of effort to produce, and it was such a fine looking ship, is sad. It is. The Algerie has been described as the best pound-for-pound -pound heavy cruiser of the Treaty era. To what extent do you agree with this? Make your case by investigating appropriate examples. Ooh, that's basically a, 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 a um, <clears throat> roundabout way of saying, what is the best heavy cruiser of the Treaty era? Mm-hmm. And you have to define your criteria. And you have to... Explain it in relation to the Algerie and others, because uh, there is uh, appropriate examples. Mm-hmm. That means it's expecting you to discuss more than one. So that's mainly that meaning you need to have details about the Algerie and probably at least two other classes, if not three, or if not three or four other classes of, of um, heavy cruiser. Ooh. town class. They're good ships. Belfast is a lovely vessel, but oh good lord, for Birmingham or, with Birmingham or Glasgow to have survived as well, that would just be brilliant. It would be. I could imagine HMS Glasgow sitting up in Glasgow. She'd now have to have her name changed. She'd be mm, Glasgow 1930-something. 
Um, I can't remember off the top of my head. But... It would be good. Question 11. Cold War cruiser construction was all a political exercise. To what extent do you agree with this statement? Evaluate both US and USSR procurement and operation in your answer. Good luck. That can... That's going to take in a lot because it's a nice, simple question. Really is. Right up until you remember, hang on. There's all sorts of wars and things taking on and they actually are worried about fighting each other and what do they actually think they're planning on doing operationally and oh, there again, there's all the politics involved. There's the fact, the very fact that the, for the US, they are building frigates, maybe for the cruiser role, but they are building things they're calling frigates, which are designated as destroyer leaders. And then they have in 1974, they have the big fear of the cruiser gap with the Soviet Union, and they rebadge them all cruisers. In which case, does that make the whole program political exercise? Because those ships weren't cruisers, but they now are cruisers because of a political scare. Or were they cruisers, just not called cruisers? Because they're frigates. Which is the traditional name for what it actually would do to cruising role. And then, of course, we've got the Soviet Union. And that's just even more fun. <laughs> As said, I will set up a Discord channel. That will activate the same day this goes out. And load up your answers in PDF form. And I will suggest that I will read through them, but also if other people want to read through them and do a sort of a peer review marking, that's more to mark them. And if if there are really good ones, and if you want to, I will have a chat with Simsec and see if we can't put them up there or British or global maritime uh, or global maritime history. See if they'll take some. I am one of their editors, so uh, editors. So fifteen and a half thousand ton eight inch cruiser. Yeah. If one of these, if some of these had actually been managed, if World War Two had held off to nineteen forty two. And someone in January 1942, 1940 said, Crash Bill, we've got to have these in service. And some of them had ended service before World War II began. Lord help the Deutschland class or any of the hippers if they get caught by this thing. It would have the armour to take any hits off them. It would have the speed to catch and run rings around them. And the firepower to take them out. It'd be a case of they'd be calling in a Bismarck or a Turpitz to try and take it on. Admittedly, those are probably too busy dealing with a lion by that point, or whatever super carrier they're on over building by that point. We'll leave that one side. Question 12. Are all modern warships cruisers today, or are none? Make your case through critical inquiry of relevant examples past and present. Mm hmm. That can sound an easy answer. But then you've got to argue it. Oh, this is going to be fun. She was a good ship. They were very reliable by the time they were finishing building them. The US Navy basically developed a pattern. And they kept churning out evolutions on that pattern. And it's kind of like the Royal Navy ending up the swordfish prior to World War II. When you churn out enough of something, and you put enough force in to keep refining and refining the product, what you get at the end is... It's spring steel. It's a, it's a finely, finely tuned instrument. Really effective. Good Swedish gun technology. No wonder they work so long. Let's be honest. If you've got something which is the finest Swedish steel and works really, really well, would you get rid of it in a hurry? No. Dutch built Swedish steel. It's good. 
and it worked. And it's kind of appropriate that it belongs to who it to Peru because let's be honest Peru was buying her to counter the Gotcha Legion which was being which was supposed to be procured and was procured by the Chilean Navy renamed the Almirante La Torre. And of course the Chilean Navy had procured Esmeralda. So the first the people who procured the first protected cruiser were procuring a gun cruiser, a Swedish gun cruiser. And the Peruvians who had been traditional issues with the Chileans chose a Dutch cruiser with Swedish guns to make sure they could definitely deal with the Swedish cruiser. <laughs> oh. You might as well. And sell them. The first also 8-inch gun cruiser. They had good hulls. They had good shaping. And if you look at that hull, you can see the armor. You can see where the protection lies. Thank you for watching. I know I normally add questions to the end of these videos, but I think you've already had enough questions. You don't need any more. I hope you enjoyed. Thank you very much, and take care. Thank you for all your support, and um, yeah, I look forward to the, uh, if there are any questions, any question submissions, the Discord channel will be called Year of the Cruiser, and it'll be left permanently, because, yeah, someone might want to come back in a few years and do this, and look for all the videos, and then build up to this one. It'll be interesting to see. Thank you very much for watching. Take care, and onwards to the year of technology. <laughs>